on Shabbat, technically what happens on Shabbat, all the worlds get elevated to their source. So that's why we're, we're commanded Lishbot. We can't have any connection to the physicality because all the worlds get, get elevated. So that's one of the reasons why we're commanded not to work because it's kind of like the elevator is going up now to the, to the penthouse. You grab the elevator, you go up with it. You don't grab, then you're staying below. You know, when I became religious and they used to tell me when you don't keep Shabbat, then it's called Mechalel Shabbat. Now in Hebrew, Lechalel is when you take a flute and you, you know, Ze Lechalel. So I was like, well, I don't understand. What do you mean Lechalel Shabbat? It uh, doesn't make sense. The, the word even doesn't make sense. Now, then how I figured, how I understood it, on Shabbat, all the worlds get elevated. Everything gets elevated. Now, if you keep Shabbat and you grab the Shabbat, then you get elevated with the Shabbat. If Chaz Shalom you don't, then everything goes up and becomes a halal, a space between all the worlds and down here. So if you don't keep the Shabbat, Chaz Shalom, you're stuck in this halal, in this space, which means everything that you do is Chilul Shabbat. So that made more sense to me. And the thing is, this is unfortunate why Shabbat... <laughs> that's the problem that they don't feel, but some people actually do. So that's what this plague, this space is. You don't feel. That already depends on the individual, because there are some people that when they don't keep Shabbat, they they feel, mm -hmm. they feel. But unfortunately, when a person gets to the point that he doesn't keep Shabbat, then he's already so far away that he doesn't get affected by. He doesn't feel the absence, or if. You know, to compare a person who was born not religious and he did, never had this connection, it's almost like a person, take now a child and raise the child on a deserted island. He doesn't know that he's missing the candy because he never had candy. So even if you come and tell him, you know, there's a, such a thing as candy, he'll be like, okay, big deal. Because a person who's born religious never tasted it, so he's lacking already the taste. I'm, I'm talking about a person who was born not religious at all. So they, he doesn't have even the minimum of taste of Shabbat. Even people that are not religious, like they know. Some don't. When I grew up, I didn't know anything about Shabbat. Not only that, I didn't even you have... You said you lived near Haridin. But I, that's for sure. I knew the concept of Shabbat, but I didn't know what it means to... Sh I didn't taste the time of Shabbat, the taste of Shabbat, to say, oh, I actually like it. So when you born... If you never, if you were born not religious, you know about the concept of Shabbat. But when you don't keep it, you don't feel like you like okay, it's another just another day. You don't feel like the absence. Now, if you were born religious, you kept Shabbat many years, then you stopped, and you some people they feel they feel like I meet a lot of people that they that they in the beginning. <laughs> But I meet a lot of people that they, you know, went away from, from their path and they tell me, I feel, you know, this rihuk, this distance on Shabbat. I, seem, I feel something going on on Shabbat. Unfortunately, the more you drift away, then the less you feel. You lose the sensitivity. That's the whole problem with people who drift away in, in sin. Slowly, slowly, it gets... It it gets and that's yeah. it. Or oh, if Chas Shalom, you're born, you're not born into it. Why a lot of people who are they were born not religious, they come, they light one candles on Shabbat, right. or they put fill in once, and they're like, I don't feel anything. Right. People think that you're gonna come and put fill in on, and like you're gonna faint from the kedusha. The thing is that the body is so far away, the body is so full of klipot that you're not gonna feel anything. Yeah, the thing is that in, in the spiritual level, in the spiritual level, any mitzvah a person will do will ignite this godly spark in the body. That's the whole point. When you want to approach somebody and you want to bring him close to Hashem, you can't just scream at him, oh, you're going to go to again. Oh, that's not going to work because the person will be like, okay, you know, leave me alone. You're sugar. You want to get somebody closer to Hashem. You just you, you, you can't talk with reason because you're going to come and start talking about spiritual things. They'll, they'll be like, that, that's nonsense. 
But if you want to awaken this godly spark, you make that person do a mitzvah. So what happens is, the neshama is sitting in the body, for many years it's just been doing sins all day long, eating not kosher, doing so many bad things, the neshama gets covered with all these layers, these klipot. So anything that you're going to approach to that person, there's going to right away, right away going to be an anti. Uh, no, 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 I don't believe it. I don't want to do it. You want to come for Shabbat? No, 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 I don't, I don't I believe it. You want to do a mitzvah? No, 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 it's fine. What about lighting candles doing a mitzvah? Of course. Why not? I have a friend, they, they, she, they light candles every week. And? Don't, now the thing is, that the way it works... No, the thing is, when the person is in, in such a level that the, the neshama is so covered with klipot, then the neshama, doesn't matter what you're going to let him do, the neshama will not feel anything. It's like, you know, you take now a, a source of light and you cover it with many, many, many layers. Right. You're not going right. to see the light. Like N- now, if you're going to come now and make the person do a mitzvah, the neshama starts waking up. Now, usually what happens, right away the etzah will shut the, the, the light down. No, 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 don't get excited. Uh, shut up. Now, when you're saying some people, they do all their life, they light candles, you know what the Yetzirah comes and do? He says, no, pray, fine. Light the candles, but continue sleeping in all the rest of the stuff. So the Yetzirah comes and tells you, yeah, yeah, light your candles, it's time to light, it will make you be very yeah. perfect, <laughs> to shut you down. It was almost like Shabbat, and she was like, she knew that I was, I need to, like, I was telling her that I, like, you know, she knows about the lighting candles. She's like, Sarah! You got a light, yeah. But then the Yetzirah is smart. He's going to tell you, no problem. I'll give you one mitzvah. Just shut up. Don't come and demand all the rest of the stuff. And that's how the Yetzirah will work. Now the thing is that when a person is so far away from religion and the Neshama is so covered with these klipot, you come to approach that person, you tell that person, you want to put filin on? No. Why not? I don't believe in it. And it doesn't matter how you're going to come and explain it, they'll be like, nonsense. And then if you finally somehow convince that person to put filin on or light candles or come to Ashur Torah, not only that nothing will make sense, they don't feel anything. You know, only people I meet, uh, you know, they come to our Shabbat, they light candles and like, okay, nothing happened. Like people think that you're going to light the candles and so, so the thing is, some people do. Some people are very spiritually sensitive that they do a little mitzvah. Can we do it again? Want it again and again. Huh? And like, and then we went to the hotel and they were all like crying and I'm standing there religious and like I didn't feel anything. I'm like, why don't I feel this that they're feeling? Yeah. Like this connection. That's, that's the, the same metaphor of the little kid that grows up on a deserted island. He never had ice cream in his life. Suddenly you gave him one lick of the ice cream, he gets all excited. You have ice cream every week, you don't get excited from the ice cream. So it really depends. Depends on the neshama. Some people, yeah, they don't, they don't feel anything. You come and make them do a mitzvah, nish, nothing. Some people, you just do something, they feel this, uh, this amazing arousal. I have a, a, a person that I know that I took him once to the mikveh. He went out of the mikveh like, uh, you know, he was like, I can't believe it. He was like, for a whole week, he's like, you know, I, I can't even explain to you how I feel. I feel like... Like this rock was removed from me. So each person gets, gets affected by something else. I know a lot of people that they're like a rock. Doesn't matter what you're going to do. I don't feel anything. So it all depends. The thing is that we create our own masachim, his own klipot. So if I'm now removing myself far away from Hashem, that's going to be very hard for me to come back and I'm not going to feel anything. Now the thing is that talking how we started talking before about the Rosh Hashanah, when Hashem wanted to create the world, Hashem said, okay, I have to remove this godly light in order so there will be some type of existence. So Hashem basically contracted His light, made these tzimtzumim. Now the tzimtzum, this contraction is for us, not for Him. Hashem doesn't, doesn't change any, anything for Hashem. The concealment of the light is for the nivraim, for us. So when Hashem hides himself in these contractions, in these timtumim, like these layers, the one that gets affected from it is the one that it's done for. So I'm not going to see Hashem. Not that Hashem doesn't see me. Or if it's, it's like a one-way, one-way direction. 
And the thing is that when I now decide chas v'shalom by mistake, on purpose, by chance, by not knowing, but let's say I do an avera. What does it mean, avera? Avera, the word in Hebrew, avera, people translate it, avera, is a sin. I did a sin. But avera from, comes from the word av, lavor, avar. So if I'm now in the side of Kedusha, in the Tzadak Kedusha, and then I move over here, I went away from the Kedusha, so avarti. I went from here to here. That's the avera. I remove myself from the, from the realm of Kedusha, and I move myself over here. Now once I move it, nobody, I can't, I can't blame anyone but myself. If I did, chose to move over here, then I, I'm responsible. I can't complain to somebody, oh, because of you. Now, obviously, there's the many different levels in the Avera. Some, uh, some of the sins, you don't even know that it's a sin. So then, the, then the, there's no punishment. There's, no, there's nothing against you. There's still the blemish that was done by the sin that needs to be polished. But some degrees of the sin are harder. If I know that it's a sin, that, uh, that I wanted to do it, that I had a fight, there's many different levels of the severity of the sin. But the fact is that when I, chas v'shalom, do the opposite will of Hashem, then I transfer myself from here to here. This is the concept of avera, la'avor mitzad echad etzad shani, from moving from one place to the other. So obviously when somebody is on the other side of Kedusha, the other side of holiness, then he's, there's rechuk, there's no connection. So some people are very far away, so nothing you're going to say, do or think, they're not, not going to feel anything. Sometimes the, the distance is not so far away. Sometimes a person, he did one little mitzvah, and even by chance, or by, or by like you said, with the, the, your husband used to put fill in on the, on the man. Sometimes all it takes is one little mitzvah for the neshama to start waking up. Now usually how it works is that when we're in our body, we have two nefashot. We have a nefesh be'emit and a nefesh elokit. Nefesh elokit is the godly part of the nefesh, and nefesh be'emit, exactly how it sounds, be'emit comes from the word be'ema, like an animal soul. The godly soul only wants to do mitzvot, only wants to learn Torah, only wants to do chesed, only wants to be connected to Hashem. He doesn't want to do anything that has to do with this world. The nefesh be'emit is like an animal. It wants to eat, it wants to sleep, wants to enjoy everything in this world. It wants to enjoy everything that has to do with this world. And they constantly battle. Now, if I feed my nefesh abeimit constantly, and I, t and, and I take my nefesh abeimit to restaurants, and I let it sleep in, and I let it enjoy the indul to indulge about everything in the world, then the nefesh abeimit is empowered. What's called in Hebrew, be gabrut. So what happens if I'm now, imagine two friends. One of them is like a good guy, one of them is a bad guy. Imagine the bad guy is like a stronger personality. Every time the good guy will say, hey, let's go do this and this. No, 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 no. Now we're going to rob this place. Now we're going to do this. Now we're going to do that. So when you feed your nefesh abeimit constantly, then, then the nefesh abeimit is in control. So you want to go to a shiur Torah, suddenly you get an email. Tonight there's a shiur Torah. You're like, oh, maybe I should go. Right away your nefesh abeimit, no, no, what are you talking about? There's a football game tonight. You can't go to the shiur Torah. So right away the nefesh abeimit comes and opposes. And you know, something you, you walk in the street, somebody asks you for charity, you, your nature is like, oh, oh maybe I'll, I'll give him some money. Right away, you put the money in the pocket, and you never should be no, 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 you, you're about to buy something to eat now, forget about it. Look, look, I see a sale over there, you know, I see a, a big sign, 20% off, maybe you can get new shoes, forget about this guy right now. So, your nefesh abeimit will constantly see danger coming and, ah, no, 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 relax, relax, it's fine. We'll come with all sorts of sophisticated... Why is it called beimit? Because a behema is an animal. Oh, I thought like, like from the No, behemit comes from the word behema. It's an animal. It's an animal soul. Not animal that it's like a, uh, like a wild animal. But it has the traits of an animal. And animals... If you, what's the difference between us and animals? We have sechel. We can think. More than that, we can make a choice. This is good, this is not good. Animals don't have a choice. Animals work by their instinct. So we know that... Uh, Uh, that like I'm, the that I'm not, this is, uh, this is not the, what I'm talking about. I'm talking no, about... No, no, an animal it's works like only by instinct. You'll never see a cow... How do they know to mate? How do they know to 
They worked only by instincts. Yeah, animals only work by instincts. What does it mean? No, you're saying that's an instinct. Yeah. But you'll never see a, a lion eating grass. Or you'll never see a cow running after a sheep and, so and, and eating it. Sense. It's not common sense. It's an instinct. Because there's it, in Hebrew, maybe I'm using the wrong word instinct. In Hebrew, it's called teva. Teva achaya. It's their nature. So, so, for example, we know that an eagle is very rachman, very uh, merciful. And we know that uh, a crow, a rev, a black crow, is very sadistic. So we know a famous story that the Ramban, not the Rambam, the Ramban, he was the advisor of the king at the time, the Sultan. Now, he was the only Jew, and all the rest of the advisors didn't like him because he was like the smarter one. He always get the good, gave the good advice. The king liked him. So there was one argument, and the Rambam said, no, whatever teva, whatever instinct is instilled in the animal, you cannot change it. We as humans, we can change. This is the, the, the ma'ala, the advantage of a human being, that I can be here, and I can change to be here. There's no such a thing that a person says, oh, I'm, my nature is to be lazy. I'm always going to be lazy. No. It's an excuse. Because it's difficult to change the nature. That's, now, of course it's difficult. I didn't say it's easy. Now, of course, but you have the power to change your teva. Actually, Hashem put you in this world to change your teva. So if Hashem put you, if you're now saying, I'm lazy, you can already know this should be your easy uh, 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 instruction to know my avodah is to break this laziness and not to be lazy. If my teva, if my nature is to be cheap, it means I have to work on my cheap, I have to be, work on it and break it to become not cheap. So the thing is, most people, they use it as an excuse, and they're like, oh, it's my nature, I'll never change. No, you are put down in this world to actually break it. Well, it doesn't matter if it takes you years. Excuse me? Exactly. Some people die still with the same as they... So they, so they miss the point. You know, being from, living as a God-fearing person is not to run after mitzvot all day long. It's the mitzvot is just the tools, how to, to work in this world. But Hasidut explains that why, why am I here in this world? I was good. It was very fun for me in, in Gan Eden. Who, who asked to come down here? What do I need to come? My neshama was sitting in Gan Eden, seeing on large screens, TVs, Hashem all day long. I had Giluim, Gilu'e Lukut. Who asked to come here? Why do I have to be here? So the reason why we came here is to elevate, first of all, to elevate the entire world. When I'm, when I'm being placed in this place in the world, I have to elevate this nekuda, this place in the world. But more than that, I came here dressed in a body, dressed into a nefesh, to change and, and, and elevate the body, to change the nefesh, to work on my midot. There's a concept that we know that we have to work on avodat midot. We have to constantly work on our midot. Now, if I'm on a pilot, and I'm very religious, and I go to shul every day, and I eat kosher, and I do Shabbat, and everything, but I'm very, like, like autopilot, I'm, like, sliding, I'm not doing anything. The fact that I'm doing mitzvot, it's very nice, and Hashem is very happy, and I'm going to get a great sachar in Gan Eden for that, but I'm missing the point. It's like going on the highway, putting the gear in neutral, and putting the gas all the way down, nothing moves. If you don't step up, if you don't grow, you fall. Exactly. Exactly. This is what I always say, when the, life is like comparing to driving a, a bike. If it's easy, means you're going down. That's how it is. So obviously we came here not to like, uh, for sure not to do sins and enjoy this world. But let's say a person already is in a level that he's at the tea, he's from, and he's doing mitzvot. If he's not constantly working on refining himself, then he's, you're losing the, the, you lost the point. The mitzvot is very important to run after. And we have to learn Torah and we have to do everything. That's just the tools how to deal in this world. No, and then once you mastered, yeah, you constantly have to refine yourself. And whatever is the hardest for you, you're lazy, you're cheap, you're whatever. Not you, I'm just saying a person is... There isn't just one There's like a person can have millions. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's what you have to do all your life. So if I'm lazy, I can tell you on myself that when I became religious, I came to the show whoa, with a whole list of things that were very, very bad. 
And I can tell you that half of them, yeah, half of them I already completely changed it, completely. And some things I'm still working on it. So the whole point of doing tshuva, of living religious, is not necessarily to follow all the mitzvot. That's you have to do. Your whole point is that you want to refine yourself constantly. Constantly refining yourself to be more, more and more better. Now, the thing is that Going back to the, to the story with Ramban, so they had an argument because Ramban said, no, we as humans, we have the power to change our nature. The way that we were born is not how we're supposed to leave the world. We came through here and we're going out from here. So if I came and I didn't do anything, I, I missed the point. So we came here to refine our midot. So at the time, so Ramban said, no, we as human beings, we have the options of changing our nature. Animals you cannot change. So the other advisors were arguing with the Ramban. They're like, no, we can prove to you that you can train an animal to do whatever, whatever you want. So they said, okay, let's put it to the test. So they, they, the advisors, they took a cat and they trained the cat for months to do whatever they wanted. Came the day that they came to prove the, the experiment. So the advisors, the advisors came and the king was sitting. They made a whole thing out of it. And then they brought out the cat that they trained for months. And whatever they told the cat to do, he did. And the cat came out with the, with the trays of food. And the cat did this and the cat did that. And everybody, you know, got all excited. Wow, they really trained the cat. Look, the cat is serving food. The cat is doing this. The cat is doing that. So the Ramban looked at it and he laughed. So he went and he pulled out from his pocket a little mouse. He threw the mouse on the floor. The second that the cat saw the mouse, threw all the, all the trays and started running after the, the mouse. So you can train the animal to do whatever you want, I mean, but you can't change its nature. But yeah, and how many times you see a lion that is trained that. Uh, that he freaks out and suddenly eats the trainer. So here yeah, now in Disneyland, whatever, Waterworld, wherever the, where it's called, Disney World, they had like 15 cases in the last couple of years that the, the, the whales, they eat the trainer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now I saw not too long ago somebody said, yeah, because the whale got freaked out at some point and he attacked the trainer. And I saw literally a few days ago, somebody emailed me a, a, a video. It was with a joke. It doesn't matter the joke. But you see a person that was like making a show with the crocodiles. And putting the head into the crocodile's head. There's movies everywhere on YouTube and Facebook. And then he bit him in the middle of the show. So you see so many shows that the, the lion bites the trainer, the, the whatever. So you can train an animal, that's for sure. But you can't change its nature. So you take now any animal and you train it, but then put it in its natural environment, it will forget the rules. But the thing is that we're not animals. We, we have the ability to arouse ourselves that we can work on our midot. So if I have a bad trait, I first of all, it's very easy to recognize your bad traits. If I'm lazy, if I'm cheap, if I'm stingy, if I'm whatever, I can recognize right away my midot raot, my bad, my bad midot. And if you want to really refine yourself in this world, you work on that. And that's the hardest to really refine, you know, refine your midot. But at the end, in essence, Hashem doesn't really need your mitzvot. You're doing mitzvot for yourself. Mitzvot is like, you know, how to, to maneuver in this world. You walk into a car. Now take a person who grew up on an island. You give him a car keys. Doesn't matter how fancy the car is. He doesn't know that the right pedal is to move and the left pedal is to stop. So you have to learn, oh, you move this stick. If you move this stick, you start driving. And if you press this stick, it moves. You press that stick, the car stops. So Hashem gave us a lot of these mitzvot. Press here, you're going to get it there. Don't press here, you're not going to get there. So Hashem gave us mitzvot to, to learn how to maneuver in this world. But the main avodah that we want to do is we want to refine, refine our midot. And there's a lot what to refine. And exactly like you say, you have a whole life. Life to, to, to refine it. That's not that you wake up in the morning like, okay, from today, I'm not going to be cheap anymore. It doesn't work like that. It, you, it takes you a long time to change yourself. So going back to what we were talking about that you have in your body, a nefesh abimit, 
Not that it's a behemit comes from the word behema, an animal. Why? Because it wants to be involved only in gashmius. It wants to eat. It wants to get physical pleasures. It wants to, to enjoy life. It wants to sleep. It wants to enjoy this world. It doesn't care sitting in a shul. It doesn't want to go to a shul Torah. It wants to go to a movie. It wants to sit with friends and have a cup of coffee. Your nefesh abeyemit will constantly will move you away from Gdusha. And you constantly have a battle. Now if a person lives a certain lifestyle that is so far away, this nefesh abeyemit will slowly, slowly diminish the power, the light of the nefesh elokit. And then you approach this person with a mitzvah. Either he doesn't want to do it, it doesn't, doesn't interest him, or he does the mitzvah. It's like, I didn't feel nothing. You know how many people I drag them to come to our Shabbos table, and they're like, you know, very nice family, and the food was very good, but I don't feel anything. It's just another day. I feel actually more fun when I'm on the beach. Because sometimes the nefesh elokit is so buried that that the, the doesn't matter what you're going to do, doesn't see, doesn't see anything. Like how you said with Shabbat, sometimes, yeah, I'd rather be in a club, I'd rather be on the beach, I'd rather be here. Why? Because your nefesh abeyemit, your nefesh abeyemit is, is still like an animal. You, you put now an animal in a cage and you make the, uh, you know, it's food, walk around outside the cage. Excuse me? It's difficult to tame. Yeah? Well, the way for you to, to, to reduce the power of the nefesh abeyemit is to feed the nefesh elokit with mitzvot, so like with Torah. Yes, yeah, so slowly, slowly. But like you said, sometimes I'm doing avani, even it's cooking amazing davening, and then and then the I next day it's worse. Later, even, like, but that's normal. The same that's normal. That's normal. A lot of people say and a lot of people think that you elevate yourself to a higher level and everything should be perfect. But I'll give you a very simple example. Go to a hospital now and go to a heart patient and look at the monitor. What do you see? Up and down, up and down, up and down. True. You know, the heart, that, when the heart is straight, that's dead. So when everything is straight, it means that you're spiritually dead. You're constantly up and down, up and down. So one day you're up, one day you're down. If you look, if you, the day that you're down, you're like, ah, what a shitty day, and I didn't pray, and I didn't do this, and I didn't do that, and, I'm, and I, I didn't say any brachot today. If you're looking at it in a very negative way, then you, you, you're missing the point of the going down. It's almost like, you know, kids, they like, like, like jumping on trampolines. If I'm going to jump now on a trampoline, I'm going to throw up after a second. But when I was a kid, you know, kids, you put them on a trampoline, they don't stop. Why? They get some type of this rush this excitement from jumping up down up down up down and you put an adult on a trampoline he'll throw his guts out so the same thing the neshama has to go up and down up and down up and down so when you're down if you feel down then you then you you're missing the point that why do you go down you go down to jump up again so you need these days that you're down because if everything will be good that's the, you, you you you're riding on a straight line you don't get the chayut. What's the whole point of the heart? Pumping in, pumping out. Pumping in, pumping out. Yeah. Exactly like a muscle. If you now go to a, a, a gym, and you go and you take a piece of weight, and you go like that, and you don't move, you didn't do nothing. You have to, you have to pump it. Uh, so the same thing in the in spiritual level. If you don't pump, uh, in, out, in, out, up, down, up, down, your neshama, it gets flat. There's no avodah. So the fact that you have a bad day, if you let the yetzer arat over, overtake it, then he will tell you, oh, look what a bad day you had. Yeah, it's going to take all the air out. But if you're saying, okay, I am now bad day, yeah, so for tomorrow, I'm going to be in the up. So it's a normal thing. Don't let that discourage you by... Okay, so sometimes the, the jumping, sometimes the trampoline is a little bit loose. You have to go very down. But the good thing is it that, that you can take... To, to likachat, in Hebrew they say, litfos nuva. Sometimes, you know, when you want to jump, you want to jump far away, or you want to jump over a big wall, you have to go far. You see, you know, I remember when we were kids, we wanted to jump over a wall, you go like 50 feet far away to run real fast and then you have power to jump over the wall. So it's everything you can see in the physicality, you can compare it to the spiritual level. Sometimes you have to go far away so you can get the, how do you say it, in English, like to the drive? 
No, it's not drive. Tnufa is like when you, 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 you go far to like accelerate, like a car. You want to drive fast, you have to accelerate. The car doesn't, you don't just press the gas and you're 100 miles an hour. The car has to take off. It's kind of like taking off. Gradually. So, gradually. so the thing is that the Yetzirah is waiting for the second that you're a little bit down to come and push you. You know those annoying friends that you're having a bad day and then they come and annoy you? Because they, they have this bad midah that they see you in a bad mood, then they come and annoy you? So the Yetzirah is that type of a friend. He sees that you're having a, a bad day, that you're not so strong spiritually, then he comes and annoys you. Yeah, yeah, no, you didn't do this, you didn't do this. That's what the Yetzirah. Yeah. To push you when you, you know, you, unfortunately, some people, that's their nature. They see you, they see you down, they come and annoy you. They, instead of picking you up, so your nefesh abemit, your etzerah, all this clan, they're waiting for you to feel a little bit bad, so they can come in and, and tell you, oh, look how bad you are. Don't get excited because of that. Rather, he's saying, okay, if today was a bad day, must be that tomorrow, I will actually will have the koach. And some days you wake up in the morning, and everything you like, you know, you didn't even put the alarm clock on. You wake up at 6. You like run. You're like, okay, I'm going to pray today. And I'm going to do this. And usually every day you come to eat. You're like, oh, it's a mozzi. I don't feel like washing now. Okay, I'll just de eat this. So you find a, a, some type of a, a loophole to say, oh, it's not even a mozzi. It's, it's a mazonot. And some days you're like, oh, I want to eat because I can say birkat amazon. Some days you have this excitement. So you need to know when the days when you back how to deal with it, and the days when you're strong, how to deal with it. The point is not to get uh, dizzy because one day you're not 100%. Don't, don't let the Yetzirah trick you so much. You have to be a little bit smart.